Okay, let's let's start on time. Uh, welcome to this session about Cloud Foundry and containers and Docker. Uh, it's been a pretty good session before, so I think some of you guys are warm up on the on the topic. Uh, pleased to be here. So my name is uh, Alexandre Vasser. I work for Pivotal, I'm based in Paris. I'm part of the field architect group. Um, I've been working in you know development, uh, Java, enterprise architecture, and cloud platform. <coughs> for about 20 years, been with Cloud Foundry for about five, six years, uh, part of the VMware team when it started. There as an R&D project, I've launched the uh, Cloud Foundry meetup in Paris, so if you happen to visit Paris, uh, you know, send an email and uh, we'll get you uh, have a talk over there as well. It would be fun. Um, <coughs> I've been discussing with many, um, you know, organizations looking at, you know, cloud native platforms, platforms, containers, um, you know, over the years. And obviously, you know, the landscape is changing uh, very quickly. You've heard all about uh, Diego, uh, the fact that Diego will be part of the, you know, Cloud Foundry certified for 2017 next year, uh, although we have it, um, you know, production ready in Pivotal for a little while. Um, and I, I think it was a good time for, you know, stepping back and looking at what, what you can do with that. And it's not just the only thing you can do around uh, Cloud Foundry and containers. And there's been a number of initiatives around containers as well as you know, for services and not just for apps and also for pipelines. So uh, I wanted to aggregate three use cases and uh, discuss some of the architecture, uh, the uh, you know, building blocks and moving parts, uh, which implies you know, challenges if you're the platform architect or platform operation team, and pretty good use cases if you are more on the uh, user side of it. I try to um, articulate that with some demos. Uh, we have very short time, so my demos are recorded. I don't want to download stuff from the internet or whatever. Uh, and uh, you know, hopefully it will give you a feel of you know, what, what, what the stuff can, can look like. Um, so let's start with one thing, and, and you have heard yesterday about, you know, here's my app, uh, run it in the cloud for me, I don't care how. Um, so you know, the first use case is here's my app as a container, um, run it for me, and you know, most importantly, you know, keep it running for me. So scale it, heal it for me, and I, and I don't care how. Um, so, you know, if you think about it, you know, that's enabled by, obviously, Diego uh, and, you know, the work done in Garden and the work done in Garden Run C, uh, previously Garden Linux, uh, with this, you know, goal of having a kind of a standard for, for container libraries uh, and the same Run C, part of the open container initiatives uh, that Docker is using. So, you know, fundamentally, when you go into that use case, the container becomes the unit of currency. Uh, even if you know the container, you know contains the app, uh, the user is exposed to the container. He has to build the container upfront rather than the platform building the container on the fly. Uh, and you CF push a container. So what does it mean? Uh, it means that you actually CF push a reference to a container that exists into a system. Uh, that in the ecosystem is called a registry, uh, and the registry is kind of the namespace. Uh, can be secured, can be completely uh, online, or can be private, uh, and the registry is having a repository, obviously, to store stuff. So there's a number of moving parts. Um, as a user, you have an app. Uh, you probably need to care, in, uh, you know, care about you know the app as well as its it, it runtimes. Um, you know, if it's a Java app, you need a JVM, or maybe you need Tomcat, or maybe you need whatever the app uh, needs, as well as you know all dependencies. So you would build up a Docker file uh, in the Docker uh, world uh, to describe that. Uh, you would use your Docker tools on your machines, uh, maybe on a pipeline actually, to build the image and upload the image to the registry. And then you would use uh, Cloud Foundry, and then it creates a dependency between Cloud Foundry as a runtime platform and Docker as a registry, uh, because Diego would pull the image from the registry. Uh, so the registry becomes a fairly you know, sensitive component for your runtime platform. Um, so there are many, many things that you need to think about when you start doing that. And obviously, um, you know, as use cases uh, start to appear, I think you need to be cautious about what you put into your Docker file. Um, and you know, I think the previous session was, was pretty much about that. So let's go through a you know, quick example um, to look through that. Um, as I said, I recorded the demo because you know, building and pushing uh, Docker file is not going to be fun over Wi-Fi. I did that uh, with fiber to the home. It was good. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so exactly. So if it's too small, I have like uh, you know the zoom thing. Uh, so it's it's a basic app. Uh, doesn't matter. We have a Docker file, uh, parent image, and the parent image is having a parent image, etc. My app, the port, 
and the kind of start command for the app. Uh, it's Java, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it's actually Spring Boot. Then using the Docker tools, I built that stuff locally in my machine. Uh, the little Docker demand would, would, would run locally if I want to try it. Layered file systems goes in. If you look in the, in the bottom, uh, my local, local images uh, gets, gets updated. And then I can uh, try it. I can try it without Cloud Foundry. It's just Docker. Uh, maybe map you know, my local machine port to the container port. Need to remember what I put in the Docker file, by the way. And looks to be working. Um, you know, shut it down. I don't, I, don't, I don't care because I want to run it in the cloud. So uh, Docker push to my uh, registry. Um, um, not providing a server name, so I'm going to the public docker.io registry, and I'm logged into it before. You haven't seen that. Big uploads, um, especially if you remove the image uh, all the time. Uh, in parallel, I'm going to uh, connect as a user to my Cloud Foundry, check that I'm running Diego, check that my admin has enabled Diego Docker so that I can actually push Docker image as is. Um, that's fine, it's enabled. Uh, in this meantime, my image has been uh, uploaded to the docker.io. It's been just updated a few seconds ago, so it's good to go. Um, and then I can start to do a CF push, dash O, uh, dash O like the Docker image, uh, or OCI image, it happens to be a pretty good name, uh, dash O, rather than dash D or whatever. Um, point to the um, registry, um, and then give it a name, uh, CFS like CF submit. Um, then we have the um, staging process that is happening in the back. Um, so we'll, we'll watch at the two things in parallel. Uh, this is running on a Pivotal Cloud Foundry on my uh, home lab uh, private DNS. So if you see a password, I don't mind. It's, my, it's on my private uh, VPN. Um, so it takes a little while. Um, you know, as much as I understand that you know, maybe build pack is actually slow, blah, blah, blah. Actually, I don't think Docker is that fast to start anyway, because there's a number of things that is happening uh, in, in the overall process as a whole, uh, from Diego to you know, the image running <laughs> to the host check, check you know, kicking in and the host manager and the router having the root, you know, accessing the app and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and of course, there's demand on the storage. Uh, and you know, I haven't heard a lot, but I think the storage uh, backend of a Cloud Foundry is really, really critical to the overall Cloud Foundry performance and staging. Once you're there, you don't care it's a container or not, it's just an app. So you can scale it, uh, CF scale, just as you would do. Um, you could uh, look at you know, the logs, they are aggregated across uh, different, different um, cells. You can see cell zero and cell one because they have two containers, they've been distributed, it's all fine. Uh, survive you know, high availability and placement. Um, and then um, I can access the app. Uh, look at you know, the app running into my container kind of network in the cells. I can kill the container. Uh, when I click that button, I see an index one. It's actually got killed, right? Because it says, hey, it's me, but then it sort of get killed. Um, and then I can see that uh, there's only one left, but actually, you know, uh, auto healing starts to kick in. So there's another one starting, uh, which is good. And it's the container one that was just killed. Uh, if my admin has enabled also um, SSH access to the container, and I really mean the Garden Diego container, uh, doesn't matter if it is OCI or build pack based container, I can SSH in using my you know, UAA credentials, et cetera. Uh, if my you know, admin and org admin and space um, admin have provided, my, provide, provided access to me. And here we are, we are in the container. Um, and we have auditability, so it's a truly you know, a generic platform, and I can check you know, who's, who's got in into SSH, has the container crash, whatever, you know, all the Cloud Foundry uh, goodness uh, kicks in. So you know, it gives you like a quick overview, uh, very, very quick, uh, very fast, but I think you know, all this is what we already know. Uh, so let's switch to another use case. Uh, as you know, in Cloud Foundry, we have apps, um, but we have also services. Um, so second use case is really about service as a container. Um, so unlike the first use case, uh, service as a container is not so much part of the core of the Cloud Foundry, um, you know, <coughs> stable components. It's been actually kind of more R&D, research projects, et cetera. But let's talk about, let's talk about uh, the use case before talking about the implementation. So the use case is, you know, get me an instance of X. Uh, 
<coughs> database, uh, caching, um, whatever, NoSQL. Bind it to my app and do that over and over and over again. Uh, maybe with actu actually a different size of the service X, and I don't care how. And all that is not specific to containers, it's specific to the service broker. Uh, the service broker is really, really um, you know, variable in Cloud Foundry because it gives the user the um, level of abstraction. So the way the service is implemented, is it a dedicated VM? Is it a pre-provisioned VM? Is it a container on the fly? Is it a container on the fly uh, onto uh, container backend, uh, Swarm or Kubernetes or whatever? Is a service implementation detail? And the way the uh, application is going to talk to the backend service is actually managed by the service broker that will provide credentials from the service to the application uh, using the mechanism that you know many of you know, which is you know the VCAP service environment properties, etc., injected into the app. Um, so um, it's pretty interesting, though, to look into you know how does it work if you really want to go and do that with containers and using your favorite you know container backend, um, like for example Swarm. And I know uh, you know some people have been actively looking into that. It was an R&D project started by uh, Ferdi, uh, Ferran Rodenas in Pivotal, uh, put on GitHub, and I, I know at Stack and Wayne and Dr. Nick is um, fairly actively maintaining that. So I don't think he will learn anything looking at that. Um, so what are the moving parts? Um, somewhat, you know, the same. Um, we, need, we need an image with the service. Uh, someone has to build and prepare that. Having kind of, you know, Cloud Foundry in mind because the image will have to pretty much publish credentials back into the Cloud Foundry service broker components. Um, then using, you know, some kind of container backend, uh, Swarm or Kubernetes or whatever, we need a service broker that will interact with that to ask for the container provisioning. Um, synchronous, asynchronous, etc. the service broker can do anything. Um, key point is, of course, that once, you've, once you're there, you actually need to operate kind of two platforms, uh, the app platform with Cloud Foundry and the container platform uh, with the kind of container backend. Um, so you you then decide, hey, you know, why don't we take this container backend and make that a Bosch release? So this is also part of this GitHub uh, project with a Docker Bosch release. It's actually a, a Docker Squam as a Bosch release, which you know uh, has many benefits if you want to um, you look into that. And and you already know Cloud Foundry, or it can be a little bit of a surprise if you're more coming from the Docker world and don't know anything about Bosch and Cloud Foundry. Um, but you know, as a Cloud Foundry user, I thought, hey, you know, let's give this project a try. Uh, and, and look into this architecture. Um, so again, you know, let's have a look at uh, what it looks like from a usage standpoint. Um, switching to the video. Oops. Okay. So in this scenario, I'm going to start with Bosch. Um, so I'm really the platform admin. Uh, and with Bosch, I'm looking at my deployments. It's actually already there. So we'll see um, Docker Swarm as a Bosch release on my platform. Um, that deployment is kind of fairly small. I have, you know, kind of a control plan VM with the service broker and the Swarm manager. It, it should be better, by the way. Uh, and then I have uh, two Docker engine, right? Uh, kind of um, to manage high availability or whatever. Uh, then I have a uh, manifest file for that Bosch release. The most interesting part is the broker configuration, service broker configuration. So you can see a memcached uh, pointing to the image in a registry, right, uh, on Docker uh, Hub. And then I have two plans, one with small memory, one with big memory, etc. So that's really specific to the service broker implementation. You could configure your broker any way you'd like. Important part is this image is, you know, publishing credentials. So that image is already in the registry. It has a Docker file. You could look at it. It's pretty ugly because it's a Docker file to install and unzip, you know, memcached, etc. Um, then, uh, obviously, as a user, I still have that app running before. And as a user, uh, I can check service brokers. I have these service brokers to deal with containers. At the bottom, I just looked into the uh, Docker Swarm cluster. 
uh, to see what we are going to create on the Docker Swarm cluster as an admin. So let's just create a cache service. Create service, uh, memcache d uh, 1, 4, 128 meg uh, for the service plan. Call it cache. So it should kick in uh, into the Docker Swarm cluster uh, an image uh, kind of pool in a container creation with memcached. And then um, I can bind the service to my app. Um, and here we go, we, get, we are given the credentials. If I want my app to take these credentials and the app needs that, I uh, probably need a refresh, so maybe restart, maybe restage. Uh, depends of you know, how the first image was built. And then in my tool, whether it is UI or command line, I can see the service and I can see uh, the VCAP services credentials, uh, like you know any service broker and service implementation would, would provide to me. So if I'm accessing this app, uh, obviously my app source code can now access and discover the services. Um, and here we go. And it doesn't need to know it is Docker or not. Uh, it's just happened to be Docker in the back end. Um, so, you know, kind of great use case because I think, you know, it shows kind of how to simplify maybe Docker engine management with Bosch if you really want to go that road. Uh, but it most importantly shows the value of the service broker as an abstracted construct um, uh, on top of you know, how the service uh, implementation is made and how the service plan is provided to the user. So you know, think about it, you could switch the backend, uh, it should be transparent for the user, uh, definitely not transparent for the people doing you know, platform architecture and platform operations, et cetera. Um, so uh, what is pretty cool about that use case is obviously, um, your service catalog can be really, really broad. I think in the first prototype, they came up with about a, a dozen of services, uh, you know, kind of more development uh, ready than production ready, obviously, because then a whole lot of use cases uh, happens around how you manage, you know, service upgrade, service high availability, et cetera, and all the time it's going to be service specific, you know, the way you manage uh, database uh, clustering is not the same way uh, as managing, you know, caching clustering or, um, you know, NoSQL clustering, et cetera. So, you know, the it's, good. it's been good because it's let developers start pushing their apps, knowing that there will be Postgres, knowing there will be Logstash. And yeah, so then the ops team has some runway to actually build production versions. Exactly, so developers yeah. Aren't mucking around a laptop like we've tried to save them from. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Otherwise so they'll come back to you with Mongo and you'll say, no, we're not doing Mongo. So yeah. Anyway. yeah, exactly. So, you know, it happens to kind of drive the consumptions because then you have this service catalog. Uh, you do the homework to provide these as images and then they get started. And as you, you ramp up your production uh, system, uh, you decide if it's still, you know, that implementation or another. Um, and you know, at Pivotal, we happen to work with many partners. So we work with you know, uh, you know, Stack and Wayne on their Dingo uh, tile, uh, specific you know, uh, distro for PCF. We happen to work with uh, DataStacks and uh, MongoDB, et cetera, to provide production-ready uh, backend services. Uh, and you know, that's not up to us or the Cloudflare community to decide if containers are best for that kind of technology. I think that's more for them. Uh, data stacks, Mongo, et cetera. Uh, are they happy to run in containers or not? What are the short, shortcomings, yeah, so et cetera? The container part's been really good. It, it, as you said, all those samples don't have backups and everything right. else. But for, for the Dingo thing, we took that whole idea and just said, let's productionize. Exactly. Yeah. But it's kind of a full-time uh, job <laughs> and engineering effort uh, if you Absolutely. go that road. Yeah. So. Um, uh, the next use case is pretty interesting. It's not directly related to you know, Cloud Foundry itself, but actually it is because it's all about velocity. Uh, it's really pipeline task as containers. And uh, you know, the use case can be summarized that, you know, build this for me with a clean environment and clean build tools, et cetera, so that I can build that over and over again. Uh, and I, I know what's going on. And you know, go to the next step in my pipeline and go to production. And I want to build that stuff anywhere, anytime, because maybe people are committing into the project. Maybe people are you know, contributing images that are dependencies to my project and my pipeline, et cetera. Um, so you know, as you know, very close to the Cloud Foundry ecosystem, we have Concourse. Uh, Concourse you know, had a burst you know, into the Cloud Foundry ecosystem, uh, into the engineering uh, group. Uh, you know, the whole of Cloud Foundry is built with Concourse, and Concourse happens to be an open source project, concourse.io. Uh, it's a, you know, pipeline as code, right? So you have a file, you describe, you know, what you want to do as a pipeline, 
And quite interestingly, the Concord server, you know, given the, the pipeline is code, um, happens to be quite ephemeral uh, if you want to, uh, unlike maybe other architectures. Of course, you know, in an enterprise, you may want to have access control, role-based access, et cetera, on the concourse. But fundamentally, uh, you can spawn up a concourse in your developer machine and, and, and get going, uh, rather than having a kind of back-end, uh, you know, built uh, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, so in that use case, it's pretty interesting to also observe that um, concourse is pipeline as code, but it is having container-first architecture. So most of the concourse task, uh, sort of elementary unit of work that are part of the pipeline, are actually uh, Docker images, um, if you want to. And uh, if you deploy concourse, it happens to leverage, you know, cloud foundry components, sort of, you know, uh, hit your own dark food. So it relies on Garden Rancy as well. And you can run concourse as a Bosch release inside Cloud Foundry and, and operate concourse inside Cloud Foundry. Uh, of course, if you do that, the Docker registry kicks in again as an important component because it becomes you know, kind of the registry for the build tools if you need like Maven or Java or the CFCLI because the pipeline is going to push some, some stuff in there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, Building blocks, uh, you need images for the build tools, you need the Docker registry. It might not be so much a production system anymore for the Docker registry, but you know, if you think about continuous deployment and the sen sensitiveness of the pipeline, uh, you know, you'd better think about it as a production ready component and the concourse itself as well. Uh, and we've seen many enterprises that you know, have been looking into build tools as a build system and they are completely unable to connect the build tools to the production platform because of their you know, network segmentations, governance, et cetera. So having concourse as a Bosch release inside Cloud Foundry into a specific you know, service networks and VM pools, et cetera, solves a lot of these problems. Um, so the way you interact with concourse is with the pipeline, a YAML file, and a command line, fly. And what happens with fly is you can also inspect the container that just ran your pipeline even if the container has top, because concourse will keep the container for a little while. Um, so let's have a look into that. So I'm going to show you a fairly basic pipeline, but you know, for the sake of it, we're going to use concourse uh, as a Bosch deployment. Um, so using concourse, garden run C, uh, it's actually using the root registrar so that my uh, CF wildcard is having a concourse namespace. Um, and it's running on very basic deployments, three VMs. Um, one of it is the worker that will uh, kick in the containers. Then I have a pipeline, uh, pipeline as code, um, Git repo as a source. So if I'm changing and committing stuff in there, it will kick in in that branch. CF as a uh, endpoint as well, so I can use that as a destination. Docker as, as, a, as a registry, as a possible source or destination, and then my pipeline. And that, that thing is a unit test, maybe triggers Maven or whatever you need to do in your project. And that task is going to be a container. And that build is going to be a container. And that push is going to be a container, right? For doing all these tasks in the pipeline. So what the pipeline is doing is taking source, unit testing, built it, push it to the Docker registry. And then it could go on and CF push the Docker image and, and you know, bind it to the thing. So the task, uh, that's another YAML file. And that's the task that would do the Maven build, Maven, um, Java compilation, whatever. Uh, so obviously, if you want to do a Maven build, uh, you would need a Java runtime. So you can see the reference to the uh, specific um, Docker image. Uh, it hasn't got like my name slash Java, it's just Java because that's part of the kind of Docker official, uh, you know, root repository images. Um, so you could build your own, you know, kind of compilation VM. Um, so it's essentially, you know, pointing to the registry. Um, and then uh, kicks in some, some uh, task inside the container. So let's have a look at the pipeline uh, from, you know, deployment standpoint. Um, so using fly, I'm going to deploy that pipeline. Um, I would pass in credentials uh, into a different file. I would target a specific concourse endpoint, uh, my server, 
and uh, the credentials you know, wouldn't be in my Git server, it would be in a different file as a parameters of my pipelines. Uh, concourse would you know, kind of give the pipeline a name, so let's call it Docker, would kind of update it if, if the pipeline is already there or not. And then uh, you can access the pipeline, so you can see uh, kind of the sources, resources, app being one, Docker in the sense of Docker registry being another, and each uh, green boxes is a task. Um, and they are green because they've been successfully running before, or they might have a color code if they failed. You can look into the history of each task activities. Some of them failed, some of them work. You can look into the details, and if you look into what this task has been doing, um, this, this is the Docker push task. So it's been building the Docker image and then pushing that to the Docker registry, uh, all orchestrated by concourse. I could trigger the task manually as well, which I just did there for that demo. And while doing that, while concourse is working and executing that task, I can uh, use fly <laughs> and I can use the intercept command uh, in fly to get an access into the container and maybe check, you know, the file systems uh, or the, you know, log messages, what went, what went wrong into my pipeline step. Um, so uh, picking, picking one, you know, stage of my pipeline, getting in, I'm inside the container and what I can see in there, I can see the Docker push, right, which is really the task that is kicking in. So it's kind of using a container to uh, run a pipeline task to build another container and so on and so on. So uh, uh, gives you like an idea of you know what we mean by having these containers everywhere, uh, right? So going back to the to the deck and, and looking into the discussion, um, you know we've we've seen I don't know if you guys tried by the way. Uh, guess how many containers today in just twenty five minutes? You don't know. It's right. Okay. How many containers have we built just in these demos, right? So, right, I mean, about between 10 and 20, uh, I would need to know better the staging process because there might be hidden containers somewhere. Um, so, uh, let me think of this, yeah. So that's quite interesting, but you know, if you, if you step back a bit, you know, be on the buzz of, you know, Docker or container and a pretty nice, you know, engineering, uh, you know, topic that it is with layered file systems and all this. You know, at the end of the day, it's all about app, it's all about services, and it's all about putting that in production with high quality and, you know, velocity and, uh, you know, making sure that, you know, your process and your platform will, will you know, survive innovations. Um, so, you know, if you think about service broker, if you think about CF push and the Diego abstractions, um, you know, all of this make that platform a fairly solid abstraction and you can survive the next phase of innovation. It can, can survive the next phase of you know, innovation from the uh, Cloud Foundry group if they decide to change this and that uh, components. Um, and I think this is really important. Now, you know, devil's in the details, so I don't know if you looked carefully, if you guys are doing Java, my Docker file was pretty rubbish. Uh, you know, dash x mx 500 meg. Hmm, you know, I mean. Then you allocate a container, which size, you need to remember the size. The size is hard-coded into the Docker file. It's pretty bad. Uh, you know, in Cloud Foundry, if you're using the build pack, there's a whole mechanism that would compute the heap size for you based on the container size. That's a massive benefit in the enterprise. Uh, so as much as containers are, are fun, you know, don't forget about these little details in an enterprise. This is what matters to them. Um, so, you know, it's all about adoption, but it's also about abstractions and architecture. Don't forget day two operations and ecosystem and the moving parts that you need in addition to the Cloud Foundry platform. Buzz as well, you know, because if you don't do anything, you will frustrate people as well. Uh, so, you know, I think it's pretty good to do something to showcase, you know, the joint use cases between the ecosystems. And of course, this can work in the long term only if you emerge uh, you know, good standards and not just like ad hoc, uh, you know, uh, R&D or demonstrations. Um, containers everywhere, you've seen that, but maybe you don't need to care. It depends what you do with the platform. Uh, if you focus on app dev, app velocity, etc., it's a mean to an end. Uh, and obviously, my word of caution, uh, being there for a while, having done dev and production deployment in Cloud Foundry and different uh, scenarios, Garbage in, garbage out. I think it applies to container. Um, you know, it applies to VM in the past. 
uh, so it doesn't matter. Um, so you know, keep that in mind. Uh, have a look at what's inside the container. Look into the architecture. And I think this is why we focus so much on you know microservices, twelve factors, cloud native. You've seen my shares. Uh, it's not you know uh, on purpose. Uh, you know, I think the future is about an end-to-end -end, you know cloud native architecture on a cloud native platform. It's not just throwing stuff in a platform uh, and expect it to run. So uh, thank you for uh, your time today. Happy to take any questions. Question. Do you know, of all the public passes, do any of them <coughs> offer the Docker flag? Hmm, that's a good point. I think very few of them are actually Diego enabled, first, first of all. And then I'm not aware of any really public one, uh, multi tenant, that offer the Diego Docker flag. At uh, PDubs in Pivotal Web Services, we don't enable that yet. We don't think it's ready for you know highly secured multi tenant. Uh, so for a long for a long time, the Garden team were telling people we weren't quite ready to run Docker. So running a Docker image is just a lot harder to do securely because any like it's an untested image, right? Whereas a Warden root effect, you know everything about it. Um, now I now with if you're running Garden Run C, then out of the box and by default and without extra configuration, every container is unprivileged, is app armor secured, has a set called whitelist. It's it's basically as secure as you really can get. Yeah. We're, we're turning everything on. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think that recommendation is probably um, right for yeah. changing. It's going to change, yeah, definitely. You might want to repeat that for the rest of the audience. Oh, OK. <laughs> Yeah, maybe go come and chat with the folks there. Well, I think it's important. If you want. Uh, well, I mean, you can repeat it. Yeah, OK. So the question was about, you know, is there any public Cloud Foundry platform today that would enable the uh, Jago Docker, which is the first use case? Um, and the reality is not so much. I haven't seen any. But, uh, you know, it's expected to change uh, short term uh, thanks to the Jago Run C, because Run C is having all the primitives to run privilege in uh, to, to run containers in unprivileged mode with Apamor and you know uh, security Linux and all other other stuff, um, which you know make that good candidate. What we've seen is more like you know spawn up a specific Docker uh, cluster for a specific tenant and have them work into this thing. And I think also even Amazon is doing that. Uh, they spawn up like a specific cluster for you. Okay, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.